Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Thomas Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. Past guests of Legends Behind the Craft include Jason Bouchon of Bouchon Vintage Company, Paul Mabry from Pix, and Jerry Amobile from Cream Ridge Winery. If you haven't listened to these yet, be sure to check them out and subscribe. Today's episode is sponsored by Barrels Ahead. Barrels Ahead, we work with you to implement a one of a kind marketing strategy, one that highlights your authenticity tells your story, and connects you with your ideal customers. In short, we help wineries and craft beverage producers unlock their story to unleash their revenue. Go to BarrelsAhead.com today to learn more. I'm super excited to talk today with today's guest, Julie Culkin. Julie's the CEO and co-owner of Pedronalis Cellars, located in Stonewall in the Texas Hill Country. A well-versed wine professional, she's earned the Level 3 Award from the Wine and Spirits Education Trust and has served as president of the Texas Hill Country Winery Association. As a graduate of Stanford University and former academic, she's the author of a book and numerous articles in the field of philosophy, including essays on wine and philosophy. Welcome to the show, Julie. Hey, it's great to be here. Oh, thank you so much for being on. So in the pre-show, I noticed I, I misspelled pet or mispronounced Pedernalis. Tell me the the way the locals pronounce it in the history behind that. Yeah, Pedernales means flint. I mean, the stone flint. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the name of the, the river that runs through this part of the Texas Hill Country. So it was a logical name. A lot of things are named Pedernales in this mm -hmm. area. Uh, and we decided to, to take it for our winery because uh, our, our winery overlooks the Pedernales River Valley. So, uh, but this is also LBJ country. And in fact, most of the nation discovered the Texas Hill Country when LBJ was president, because up until then it was sort of, known by some Texans, but it's kind of really not known nationally. Uh, and a lot of people, a lot of journalists end up having to stay in this area in order to interview LBJ or just stay on top of events. And they discovered the local German town, uh, which just set, celebrates 175th, uh, which is Fredericksburg. Uh, and as it turns out, I mean, LBJ stamped everything in the area. Uh, it was larger than life person and family. And he, for whatever reason, decided to call it the pardon Alice. Uh, and so over time, almost everyone came to pronounce it Pardonalis, adding this weird R. Uh, and, you know, most people who come to our winery, they just say Pardonalis. We always you know, say Pedernalis back, but <laughs> <laughs> just insisting on the actual spelling. But anyway, it's stuck. Pardonalis. So, yeah, if you're local, you need to. <laughs> <laughs> you know what to say. You know what to say. So, Julie, as far as you, how did you get your start in the wine industry? Well, I would say I have to blame my parents uh, because uh, in many ways it was there. Uh, my parents worked for IBM. Uh, mm -hmm. My father got early retirement. If you remember in the early 90s, they were doing that for some of the older uh, oh, yeah. ex executives. Uh, now, at the time, we sort of felt bad for my, my father. Was, he had a you know, wonderful career. And now you're looking back, you're like, they gave you full retirement in your <laughs> 50s? Uh, so anyway, uh, they used that in order. They were in Dallas, right? Corporate America, they were in Dallas. And, and they decided uh, they wanted to you know, leave the urban area. My father wrote his book and did some consulting and then said, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, we're done. We did that. Uh, and uh, they sort of looked around as to what they might do if they moved you know, outside of an urban area. And there were sort of two things going on at the time in the 90s in Texas. One uh, was grapes. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, interesting enough, was emus. There emus. Was pyramid scheme of you would get an emu couple and then you would have emu babies and then you would sell them and and eventually the demand for emu meat never took off and so all these people were stuck with these large birds we so have a luckily, family member that runs an emu farm and sells the emu oil okay well <laughs> see it, it kind of died off in texas just, you know. uh, but anyway uh it, Luckily, my parents chose grapes. Mm -hmm. uh, my father uh, is from California. My mother's the, the sixth generation Texan. Mm -hmm. um, and so he grew up drinking wine and being very familiar with it. Uh, and he had a long-term friend who worked with him as an engineer early in his career, but then w ended up moving to Washington and starting a vineyard in Red Mountain, which oh, is yeah. a very prestigious area of, of Washington. And so I, their, their names are the Johnsons. And so they came and helped my parents get started, like just go mm -hmm. through the basic ropes of how do you plant a vineyard? How do you maintain it? 
Um, and so that that is, you know, it's because of their decision to do that. They had no interest in having a winery. They just wanted to live on the land, grow grapes, sell them to the local wineries, of which there were mm. about three at the time. I was going to ask that. And, and this is also in Hill Country? This is all in the Hill Country. Okay. Yeah. So uh, they happened to, they picked the, 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 the place they picked to for, for the, the vineyard was actually very, very well chosen um, and because it's, it's within Bell Mountain, which is the mm-hmm. oldest AVA in Texas. It's even oh. before the Texas Hill Country AVA. So, uh, and Bob Oberhelman, who was the person, he had Bell Mountain Vineyards. He was the one who formed that ABA. He was just down the road and he helped my parents uh, mm. early on. So there was just, they had a, a good network of people to turn to, to do this. So, uh, but as I said, they didn't want a winery. And it was really a decade later that my brother and I uh, mm-hmm. decided to form Pedernella Cellars. Um, oh, really? And at that point we had 10 years of family experience growing. And so we had had some ideas about a what not to do mm-hmm. uh which is what you know when my parents planted they planted what you would expect someone to plant in the 90s they planted merlot and cabernet sauvignon chardonnay and Sauvignon blanc now the whites look terrible from the beginning i mean just mm-hmm. awful uh they and, and over time we've discovered that basically almost no whites grow in you know in our vineyard it's just mm. it's a reds vineyard uh and so why so uh, sorry what why, why why do you think that is the case uh there's the disease pressure is fairly high and the whites are a little bit more susceptible mm-hmm. to that and the and i will talk about this more as we talk about the texas wine industry yeah. more generally you know most of the white grapes in texas are grown um or the the vitis vinifera is grown in the high plains which is mm-hmm. an area south of lubbock and the high plains has a much greater diurnal so it's like 30 degrees during the growing season between the sure. heat of the day and the cool of the night and that obviously helps the white wines quite a bit uh, or white grapes. So um, anyway, the cabin Merlot did reasonably well, but we could tell after 10 years, we're like, we should not be, why are we doing this? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, because this is like, we're never going to make, I and mean, the cab was maybe good every fifth or sixth year. We could say, ah, now that's a really nice cab. Uh-huh. Uh, and then you're like competing with California. You're like, well, that's dumb. Right. Because they mm-hmm. make excellent Cabernet Sauvignon year after year after year. Merlot, uh, it was more consistent. Um, but obviously was not popular <laughs> because of sideways, even till to, till uh, till now. Uh, so anyway, David and I, you know, really sort of dial back, and we weren't the only ones, but we were one of the ones that really say, no, 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 we've got to stop doing this. Uh, and so we I mean, we realized we needed to go with the warmer weather varieties, right? Mm-hmm. And the one that we chose as the core of our program is Tempranillo. Okay. Uh, yeah. And Tempranillo has another advantage in Texas, and you really it is the red grape you see grown everywhere. Uh, because one of the things about the Texas growing season, this is true more or less everywhere, is it's short, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas in California, you're going to have those longer growing seasons where Merlot and Cab can ripen wonderfully because you have, mm-hmm. you know, you have maritime influence or you have fog or you, know, you have elevation, you have all these things going on that make that possible. In Texas, we don't have that. Mm-hmm. And so you need something that's going to get full phenolic ripeness uh, and sugar development in a shorter period of time. And Tempranillo, as the little early one that's always ready to be picked early, and yet it's still a complex grape, is a almost perfect match uh, to Texas. And so that's why you see a lot of Texas Tempranillo. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also we also planted and and you know grow and source uh, Grenache and Mourvedre, so uh-huh. the Rhone varieties, uh, as well as we also planted. Uh, this was really because we wanted to make port. Uh, mm-hmm. We planted Triga Nacional and Tinta Amarela and Tinta Cow. Uh, what we discovered after, well, we discovered two things. A, never grow Triga and Nacional. It's an impossible grape to grow. It's like so difficult. Um, but it's wonderful in the cellar, which is the other mm-hmm. thing we, we discovered is these Portuguese varieties are so nice. The last thing we want to do is pour brandy over them. Mm-hmm. So we really converted most of those to a, you know, a different program. And we we make most, we do make port, not a lot, uh, but mm-hmm. we mostly make it with Tempranillo because we just have lots of it. Uh, and it's also a port grape. So, but the Triga rarely ends up in the port anymore. <laughs> no, 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 it's no. Just Too useful bottles. somewhere else. <laughs> how many, how, how, how much Triga do you have planted? Uh, I think at this point we're looking at three or four acres. Mm. Um, more than, I mean, it, it was a, it was a, it was one of those, we have a basically a 17 acre vineyard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so three or four acres is a sizable chunk. About 50% yeah, of the vineyard is, is, is Tempranillo. So oh. Uh, and so then most of the other things are smaller holdings. The Mourvedre is fairly, Mourvedre is another uh, great variety that you'll see, you see pretty widely in Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know, obviously we used it for up until the 19, 
19, uh, the 2017 vintage, we used it entirely the way they use it in Europe, which is really as a blending grape. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we, it was actually an accident. We were going, we wanted to make rosé out of block of, of Morved and, you know, put it in the press and the press broke. Oh. <laughs> it was like, okay, well, not rosé. It's going to be red wine. Uh, and so then we <laughs> just, yeah, we just bottled it. And then, you know, we started, you know, the wine, wine club members start trying it and we start trying it. We're like, you know, that's actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. And we should probably just bottle that on its own. So now we bottle more veg on its own as well. Uh, in addition to making a Rhone style blend, which is a GSM melange. So, mm -hmm. but anyway, so yes, how did we get into it? Yes. <laughs> because of my parents, that's how we got into it. <laughs> so the, I, I like, I always like to find the origin story. So you did have your parents, but there are plenty of wine, wine children that <laughs> that <laughs> never went into the industry. So for you, why wine? Uh, you know, I mean, I, you know, you know, I have a PhD in philosophy of all things. Uh, and, you know, obviously you know, I like to learn, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you, the thing about the world of wine is, is effectively infinite. There's mm -hmm. always more to learn. Every single vintage is something new, right? And, you know, particularly, I mean, it's true everywhere, but Texas has unusually, uh, an enormous amount of vintage variation. The weather patterns are, I mean, never resemble each other from year to year. Mm -hmm. uh, as you're always having to make these very, quick decisions is like, okay, well, what do we do now? Right. We lost that whole block to hail or, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. So you're constantly having to reinvent yourself. Uh, and that it's just exciting, uh, to, to do. And it's particularly, I mean, Texas, I mean, as, as I always say, you know, if you went on, went down to your local HEB is our local grocery store mm -hmm. and you decided to go into the Texas aisle and pick a Texas wine, it was a pretty dicey affair mm -hmm. <laughs> as to what you might find, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there were there was wine being made. There's been wine being made in Texas since the 1970s, uh, and but it was just there was not a lot of emphasis on fine wine, mm -hmm. uh, and which is you know really what has happened in the last 15 years. Um, partially because they just the, the belief was there was no market for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, you know, with the dialing in as to which grapes we should be using, there's many more fine wine producers in Texas. Uh, and, you know, being part of that evolution from, you know, literally when we started, we would go to tasting events in Texas and people we would say, they're like, well, what do you have? And we're like, well, we have this, temp you know, Texas Tempranillo. And they're like, oh, no, I don't drink Texas wines. And they just walk off and you're like, it's free to try. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you already bought your ticket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, that's just the attitude was so poor to, to go from that to where we are now, where it's, you know, being it, on the it, forefront of helping people overcome those prejudices. Yeah. And discover new grapes. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, Texas yeah, are very proud of, you know, of, of Texas. If no one's noticed. Uh, and so, you know, to be able to add wine to the list of things they could be proud of is, you know, it's, it's fun. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was talking to, uh, like we said, the infinite possibilities. I was talking to Jason Bouchon just the other day. He, he's a winemaker up in Paso. And he he's we were talking about the art and the science of wine and why he, he's so passionate about it. Because you do have such a raw palate and you have to work with both, both nature and then help just bring out the innate qualities, which is what you've seen in Texas Hill Country. Mm -hmm. So that's the next question. Why, other than the fact that your parents were there, but why Texas Hill Country? What sets it apart from the other ABAs? Uh, I mean, to give you a comparison, I mean, there, there's several things, but I mean, you know, we, we, we have, obviously we grow Tempranillo in the Texas Hill Country, and then we, we source it from growers that, you know, we work with in the Texas High Plains. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, when you, you, the Tempranillo you get from the Texas High Plains is, you know, it's, you know, it's obviously fruitier, you know, the, the acid is usually better. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want a, a Texas Tempranillo that really has a great structure, mm -hmm. the Texas Hill Country is really the, the, the place you want to source it from, because you can just get much, many more structural elements. The other thing about the, the what makes the Texas Hill Country, which obviously, you know, as most people have noticed, if they've looked at map, Texas is pretty flat mm -hmm. <laughs> in general, right? In almost all parts. And uh, so the Hill Country does kind of, you know, it, sticks out literally uh and it's because of what was called the lano uplift oh. uh and it was where this very old stone got pushed to the surface uh and what it meant is that i mean a you have all these degraded sand types and stone types which mm -hmm. is obviously perfect for grapes right they sure. love those kind of stressed conditions uh 
Uh, and you have just like a peacock's tail versus a set of choices, right? Mm. Uh, almost every site is slightly different because it's just, you know, all these different stones came up. Uh, the the comparison, I mean, and even within our own vineyard, uh, we, we've just been doing some replanting. So we're digging holes and, you know, really sort of turning down and going from the bottom of the vineyard to the top. By the time you got to the top, you were, you were, you were hitting limestone. Mm. Uh, and Mike, who was the guy who was doing the, was drilling. He said, you know, the problem was you would try to, you know, you drill down whatever the, you know, seven, eight, 10 inches, um, of topsoil. And then you'd hit this limestone and literally the auger would just be pushed off, right. And oh. try to almost flip it. And so he, you know, he had to like literally crack it, you know, to create some kind of fissure in it before he could actually then drill through it. Uh, so just those kinds of interesting variations in soil types. I, you know, I, We've known for, you know, we've always noticed that Tempranillo from the bottom of the hill tastes different from Tempranillo mm -hmm. from the top of the hill. And that's really the fun of the hill country. You don't have any of that in the high plains. The high plains is, as the name Im implies, is a plain. I mean, you stand on a bucket. Mm -hmm. It's like you're on a hill, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that flat. Uh, and it's this, uh, it's very sandy soils. Very, oh. very different. Uh, they can literally just, when you know, they don't have to drill holes. They can literally just run along and just create a trench. And they just throw the vines down when they want to plant. Okay. It's like, you know, 10 times easier. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, completely. But it's very uniform, right? I mean, there's different parts, you know, from vineyard to vineyard. But it, it takes huge, it takes much larger distances to see the interesting variations. That's great. So as far as the different, how high up is the hill country? Give, give us a little idea for the, the kind of the geology and elevation. Change. Right. I mean, the hill country obviously varies. I mean, the thing, if you look at a map of Texas, you know, you start down in Houston, right on the Gulf, right? Mm -hmm. You're basically at zero feet you know, above sea level. And then if you drive to the northwest corner, you're going, you're driving, by the time you reach like where the high plains are, you're looking at about 3,500 feet above sea level. Mm. It is literally the high plains. So, you know, as I always say, you're, you're driving across, you know, up Texas that way, you're driving uphill the entire way, just very, very slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, the hill country is in, in the middle, right? Okay. Uh, where, uh, you know, if you're at, you know, if you're at where the Pedernales is, so, you know, the, the valley floor, mm -hmm. you're looking at being at maybe 1,000 or so feet above sea level. Uh, but like where we are in Bell Mountain, obviously up one of the hills, uh, mm -hmm. you're looking at closer to 1,800, 1,900 feet above sea level. So it varies throughout, but you know, that gives you a sense of the range. Sure, but you do get that kind of, that incline. So it's when when you guys decided to start Pedernales um, Pedernales Cellars, um, <laughs> what, um, tell me about that. I mean, everybody just wants to start a winery, but they, I don't think people really fully understand the challenges that happen. Oh yeah, no, it's. I mean, I mean, we had an advantage, but as I said, we had done, we we had grown for a decade. It makes a mm -hmm. huge difference to start there. So, a the romance was gone, uh -huh. <laughs> right? Uh, because you know, once you spend you know, even one season, you know, doing all the tasks in the vineyard, and then mm -hmm. you realize, oh crap, if you ever forget anything, I mean, it's just you know, instantly there's you know negative payback. Uh, so, I mean, it was, you know, it, it was a set of very deliberate decisions. I mean, one of those, we did not put the winery and tasting room where the vineyard is, uh, mm -hmm. partially because, um, you know, Fredericksburg, as I said, this is German town, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of tourism into Fredericksburg, uh, which is one of the other reasons that, uh, uh the Texas Hill Country has become so important to Texas wine country is because you have all these people coming for other reasons and have come historically. And so now as they drive along and they're like, Oh, wineries. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and we, we literally have, it's, it's almost, it's, it's funny because, you know, rather than 29, we have 290. It's literally the, the highway that goes along and where most of the wineries oh. are. And how many so, wineries are there now? I, I saw a bunch on the map as I was researching the episode. I've never been to that area. Yeah. You, you would, I mean, people who haven't driven down 290 from Austin to Fredericksburg are shocked. Right. It's about they're, an hour and a half from Austin. Yeah. About an hour and a half from Austin, and about an hour and a half, a little bit closer to San Antonio, which is, of course, an advantage. Uh, the other thing is that Houston has notoriously horrible weather. It's humid mm -hmm. and everything. So people have looked for excuses to leave Houston since Houston was formed. <laughs> uh, and so the Hill Country is one of the places that Houstonites come. Okay. <laughs> it's just to get, you know, to something drier, you know, less so, urban. Right. So they so wanted to put uh, it on a route that people would actually visit. Yeah. So it is it is a place that people would come to. Uh, but no, as I said, we made a bunch of deliberate decisions. We didn't put the 
the wine orientation room there are uh, because the that particular road, as I described it, you know, it, it rises quite a bit. It's mm-hmm. got all these blind turns and everything, and we're just like, that is not a good place for a tasting room. Yeah. Uh, and as it turns out, you know, we made that decision back in 2006, and there is still no tasting room on that road. There's a there are tasting rooms on every single road, but not that one because mm-hmm. I think everybody looks at that and makes the same decision, like, no, that's not a good idea. Uh-huh. So, uh, so we decided to locate, you know, down the 290 corridor, but we didn't try to find a property right on 290. Mm-hmm. We actually got about a mile and a half off of it. So we have this view down into the oh, Pennsylvania yeah. River Valley. Uh, obviously it required more marketing early on to say, Hey, we're here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, um, you know, that was a very deliberate choice. Obviously I've described the planting, the deciding what we wanted to grow, what we wanted to make. And the other thing was at the time, I mean, it, a lot of winery cellar was someone else. Uh-huh. Right? I mean, you make your first wines in someone else's cellar and then you start mm-hmm. building around because there's no reason to do it in the other order. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we cellared with a guy, uh, Texas Hills, who's down in Johnson City, which is sort of a little bit closer to Austin from the, from, than Stonewall. And, you know, we're talking about what we want to do. We're like, yeah, we want to specialize in, you know, Texas Tempranillo and mm-hmm. Viognier is the white we, we specialize in. And Gary was listening to us and he's like, where's your sweet red? <laughs> and we're like, we're not making a sweet red. He's like, oh, no, you have to have a sweet red. Uh, and we were one of the first wineries to say, we're not, I mean, we're not going to make that. That just makes no sense, right? We mm-hmm. don't want to drink it. We don't think other people should be drinking it. <laughs> so, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and that was, you know, most of the winers and the biggest one, was, it's still the case that if you go into their tasting room, you realize they essentially have two wine tasting lists, one are dry wines and one are sweet wines, mm. right? uh, because there is such a strong demand for that, uh, that, you know, they want to cater because they're larger, they can cater to both ends. And we were very much like, no, uh, we're not going to cater to that if they want that. We can direct them to someplace. Um, because we do get people come in and say, oh, I only like sweet wines. You're kind of like, you are in the wrong place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I was we really, you know, we have port, but mm-hmm. few people want to sit around sipping on port in August when it's 98. <laughs> <laughs> Toasty. How you mentioned the unique challenges of marketing the winery when it's a mile and a half off the road. Mm-hmm. How did you, what was the success? What was the key to that your success in getting people into the door? You know, I, I would actually put a lot of it to the fact that we have very strong organizations mm-hmm. in, um, in the Hill Country and Texas. Um, and it's really making sure they know what you're, you're doing uh, and supporting these organizations. Like I've been the, the president of the Texas Hill Country Winery Association. So as my brother, right, I've sat on the board. I said, you know, mm-hmm. you, you spend the time like, you know, getting making sure those organizations are you're currently on the marketing committee there right now yeah marketing Mm -hmm. uh and um and so yeah supporting your local organizations that will support you uh Mm -hmm. this the fredericksburg cvb is very strong because as as i told you it's a tourism center Mm -hmm. Uh, and so you know early on i I would literally every month you know sit there and say yes these are the people we're having for live music this saturday and this saturday you know anything to say hey get me on your list of places to go, you know, when people are looking for X, Y, or Z. And so really making use of those collective marketing Mm -hmm. exercises, we do have a billboard, right? We, you know, we did, you know, uh, did get what's called what I call a directional billboard, like, Hey, turn here. Right. Mm -hmm. Kind of thing. So, uh, but yeah, the fact is, you know, we use social media very heavily. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, early on a lot of the places, Early on, we're still very, there were a lot of mom and pop kind of places. Uh-huh. And I remember sitting in one of these Texas, we, we decided to have a marketing seminar, like help people uh-huh. with marketing, right? Uh-huh. Uh, and we had one of these, you know, you had brought in one of these experts for the wine industry in California, right? Trying to get people to go through the exercise. You know, A, they think that social media is, you know, it's for losers, right? And you're like, uh-huh. yeah, it's actually kind of useful. Uh, uh-huh. And then, you know, you have like, okay, let's, let's, figure out what your target audience is. And they felt like it was wrong to target an audience that you know you should be for everyone. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like mm-hmm. that's exactly what marketing is about is to be a little bit more specific. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, and so, uh, but anyway, but yes, you know, being aware of the, the various possibilities you have to. Uh, I like joining the, the community organization. will l- lean into that collective group to help mm-hmm. rise every ship in ri- rising tide. Um, but the, the one thing is like so marketing in the, the marketing in Texas. How do you see that as different than like a winery in California 
and that being a winery outside of Napa, Sonoma, like someone that's in one of the lesser areas of California or Washington or Oregon? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, basically, you don't have to market California wine or Washington wine, Oregon wine. I mean, mm-hmm. the fact is, no one sits around saying, no, I don't think they can really make wine. And I guess a lesser known region, like I'm, I'm kind of thinking of the, um, just in my backyard, I'm down in San Diego and the, the Ramona wine region is just booming. There's about, I think there's gotta be about 40 of them now. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. It's a, and they're producing some great wines, but what advice would you give to a, like a, a regional, um, AVA that's just starting up? Well, and, you have to recognize that every time you're marketing yourself, you're marketing everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. So you definitely want to, I mean, we, you you definitely want to like make sure, you know, everyone's on the same, on the same page, right. About Mm -hmm. like, Hey, we, you know, we want to raise the bar so that people know who we are. Uh, And so, yeah, I mean, we even got on people at some point, like, you know, you know, you have the, the, the landing page with all the wineries and we would Mm -hmm. literally go to them and like, you know, I can take a picture of your winery. (laughs) (laughs) But no, you have to think of those collective terms that you are going, mm-hmm. if someone has a bad experience down the road, they'll just assume it's everyone in the area, right? Yes. So you always have to think in that, you know, you're, as I always said, you know, if I'm marketing Pedronales, I'm marketing, you know, the Texas Hill Country and Texas wine in general, right? Mm-hmm. Every single time. And, you know, but you know, yeah, that, that is just really part of it is you have to think in terms of, you know, what it's like to be a consumer who just wanders in randomly, does no right. research, right? just, you know, turns off the road in the, the first shiny winery they see. But if it turns out to be, you know, you know, the person you wish they hadn't visited, <laughs> that that's going to be their impression of the whole area. So, well, that's part of the discovery process. So hopefully they'll go to the next one down and figure <laughs> out which one they like better. As far as Pedro Nellis winery, how would you describe your, your house style? Like, well, I mean, one of the things that is very, I mean, this is, my brother is the winemaker, I should say, and mm-hmm. he did, he went to UC Davis and did the certificate program there. Oh. Uh, he has a, both of us have engineering backgrounds. His was material science engineering. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he took a lot of chemistry and mm-hmm. obviously that plays what well. What's your engineering into, background? Uh, mechanical. Mechanical. Well, you guys got both sides of the equation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, so Dave, I mean, Dave, I, you know, having that kind of background, you know, when he approached winemaking, he views it as very much a process. Obviously, you know, like you know, the mantra, you know, everything's determined in the vineyard, right? So all of that is the most important input. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then sort of the rest of winemaking is not to screw it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there is the fact that you can then, you know, when you decide, hey, well, what's going to make the best of the best come forward? Mm-hmm. Dave's approach, and it's been really followed by the winemakers that we've employed since, it's with a lot of emphasis on blending. Mm. So, you know, even our Tempranillos are very often blends, right? I mean, even just Tempranillo with Tempranillo. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, we've, you know, it's only with the 2016 vintage that we started to put out a lot of single varietal, single vineyard mm-hmm. wines. Uh, but it's still not the core of our program. It's really sort of like, hey, we just, you know, as we were doing these blends, you would re- recognize these two barrels of, let's say, Sanso were so amazing. And it was just such a shame to throw it into the GSM with everything else, right? And so you just take it out and we have a whole, you know, separate label line for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's many wineries in Texas that are much more focused on single vineyard, single variety you know, all the time, right? It's part of their main program. But our main program is mostly, you know, blended wines, even if they're varietally labeled. So as far as the blending, like what, what's his goal to sort of the style of those blends? Is there a particular like expression he's looking for? Is he Well, um, yeah, I mean, he's looking. Um, there's no question that for David, the most important thing was is always the structure. Uh, and so getting the acidity right, uh, getting the tannin profile right getting the oak treatment such that it's balanced and integrated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it, one of the things we, we said early on, and we still say it, although we don't use it as much as we use it, is we, you know, you know, you know, a bit of the old world into the new, because mm-hmm. if you look at the style of winemaking we, we were doing, it wasn't anything like California, right? You know, California, it's, just, it's almost like trying to push the sound barrier all the mm-hmm. time in terms of how big and how much can you get out of it, whereas Texas is more restrained um, okay. in terms of, and I, you know, I, there are wineries who are not like that, but I think there are a lot of wineries who have sort of realized we don't, I mean, A, we can't achieve in most varieties kind of alcohol that you guys can achieve. And so then mm-hmm. you don't have this big alcohol that you're trying to balance out with big fruit stuff. Mm-hmm. And so you're just, you're on a more restrained style. 
So, um, I like yeah. that. that. That fits my palate. <laughs> If it's my palate. Um, so as far as the, so you, do you have a tasting room or a winery tasting room? Describe for us the experience of what someone, what's it like when someone visits your winery? Well, you, as I say, you get off of 290, which is this, I mean, 290 is effectively, uh, I mean, it is a highway though. It's not, it's not a, a raised highway or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it has quite a bit of traffic on it, not simply because of the tourism, but because basically, uh, historically, Fredericksburg was sort of the last, you know, the last place before you drive to nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning you're basically driving into West Texas, which always feels like you're driving into nowhere because it's just everything opens up. And so there's actually quite a few trucks to go through here. Uh, so it's a busy road. Uh, and so when you turn off, you get you get off of that and you, you know, you're climbing up the southern um, you know, southern ridge uh, mm -hmm. south of uh, the 290. It's not it's not a big rise, but you do go up some. Uh, and then you uh, turn off and we have this nice winding driveway. We've had a landscape architect look at it. He's like, can we add some more winding here? <laughs> so, um, anyway, and you come up and the first thing you see is the tasting room. Uh, and the fact is, you know, what most people do is they walk up to the tasting room. They sort of do this like, oh, my gosh, that's quite a view, right? Because mm -hmm. it is, a, you know, it's a 180 uh, of the Paternalis River Valley that you're then mm -hmm. facing. Uh, and we have a deck. Mm -hmm. next to the the tasting room where you can just sit out and, and it's, it's uh shaded with live oaks so mm -hmm. it's tolerable until it hits about 95 degrees and then you're like yeah i'd really like to be enjoying this indoors mm -hmm. uh so and this is we're, we're in the process of, of designing a new building so we can finally have that where we have you know that view inside with air conditioning mm -hmm. so uh but right now you know if you want if you want to enjoy it directly you have to sit out on the deck to do so but um, so, and then if you want, if you do a tour, the the production facility is it's actually invisible to someone as they drive up. They cannot mm. see it. Uh, and uh, but if you walk around the tasting room building, you suddenly are like, oh, the production facility. And it's actually built directly into the hill uh, because we're near the top of you know this particular hill and the uh, mm -hmm. you know the southern you know part of south of the, of the Pedernales. Um and. Um, Anyway, we were able to dig directly into the hill. So we effectively have an underground barrel cellar, oh, okay. uh, which is very nice. Uh, it obviously helps, you know, obviously keeping that place 55 degrees, you know, 365 days a year is mm -hmm. very important. And we have a lot of hot days. And so having at least that kind of insulation has been helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, so, that's, that's key. Yeah. So, so uh, because great. if you try to do a cellar down in Texas, it's almost impossible. Almost no one has cellars because you hit what's called caliche. And it's like trying to go through concrete. Oh, uh, yeah. There's one local winery that decided, no, we're going to build a barrel cellar. It ended up being four times what they thought it would cost just because they had to blast it out. <laughs> so. like it. Yeah, it sounds like a, a, a personal goal. It's like, I can yes. do it. <laughs> I don't care, I'm going to do it. I'm going to say I did it. <laughs> I've, I've seen that too often. How, um, so is it, the, the experience at the winery, how's it evolved since you opened um, over the last, you know, 14, 15 years? Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's got bigger and bigger. I mean, it, we sometimes point out the the bar that right, we call, still call it the reserve bar. I mean, there's obviously the pandemic caused a whole nother set of changes. And that's what I was going to get to. Like yeah. we had the whole pandemic and let's come out of the pandemic. Right. Um, yeah. What, no, what I mean, we, of, um, sorry. How, how has it evolved? Like I'm constantly talking to people that have learned something through the pandemic and they've actually made the experience better coming out of it. Well, what we did, I mean, once, once our doors were closed, Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, you know, you're just, it's really hard, heartbreaking for a small business owner, right? You have these mm -hmm. people who's worked for you for years and you're like, I have almost no work for you because you're a tasting room associate. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, luckily we found out during the pandemic that making wine is an essential business. So we had mm -hmm. to do that. <laughs> right? sure. So all of the production and vineyard were, were going as normal. Uh, and so what we decided to do though, was we suddenly had this opportunity, like our doors were closed. It was like, oh, wow, we could do that remodel we've talked about for years, mm -hmm. right? Because it was just like, you know, usually it's like, how are we going to do any remodeling? I mean, it's going to disrupt mm -hmm. the tasting room operations. And, and it was like, no, there was nothing to disrupt. So uh, we had, um, we had you know, as many tasting room associates who wanted to do that. We're in here painting, tearing down, you know, we put a new face on our bar. Uh, we, we took out a whole bunch of stuff. 
because we, you know, all the merchandise we used to have, we just, you know, obviously we took it all out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we never really put it back, right? We had just have a very small uh, amount of merchandise because we just suddenly was, oh, this is so much nicer having it more open. Uh, the way that the reopening occurred in Texas, we had to do seated tastings, mm -hmm. even though we have a U-shaped bar, sort of classic, you know, bar, mm -hmm. it had to be seated. Uh, and so uh, we started bringing tables in uh, that mm -hmm. suddenly we have space to place around the the room and we've just i mean the the main bars again back to standing on only bar um, but we do have tables scattered around because we have space for them where there used to be merchandise and so and this wall of bottles you see yeah, behind me beautiful yeah we did we did that during it it used to actually it was actually because of the way the building was remodeled over or expanded over time that was actually an outside window at one point got inside and then we had just shoved a piece of furniture over to like cover it up right oh, that's <laughs> And so we're like, no, let's do something with that space. And so we turned it into a bottle rack. So, but so that was all an opportunity, uh, honestly. And, and you know, you know, I would not have wished a pandemic to have done all that, but no. you know, we learned quite a bit. And then the I think what everyone learned in the wine business was about virtual tasting. Yes, uh, because that is just like you suddenly realize, like, hey, if I get my wine to you, I don't care where you are. You can be Kuala Lumpur. We can have a more mm -hmm. or less reasonable discussion over something we're really sharing. Mm -hmm. uh even though you know you, that physical barrier of just looking into a digital screen actually becomes less when you're like oh i could taste that too right you know it's mm -hmm. like actually being in the same experiential zone and so that was a real yeah that was a real eye opener are you going to continue the virtual tastings yes we do the we do them with a group uh we formed a uh a group we call it Texas Fine Wine. I couldn't believe it wasn't available. I mean, that we could have that domain. TexasFineWine.com. No <laughs> yes, we got TexasFineWine.com, uh, and as a group, uh, it's been at various times four wineries and five wineries. We're all like more or less the same size, around the fifteen thousand cases a year size. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't have you know room for a huge marketing budget or any of these things. You know, we can't. You know, so, again, a collective effort. A so collective. It wasn't effort. just your club members. You actually formed a. A collective is probably not the right word, but you've a group of wineries all doing these tastings together. Yeah, doing tastings together. We do events together. T together, we we pay for a PR agent who works oh, okay. for the uh, this group. Uh, you know, over time now, there's many more candidates for this group, but we mm -hmm. sort of found that we. Uh, Every time we come up with candidates, where someone will be like, "No, that won't work," but we realize that it's really consensus based to make this work because we really all agree as to what are good opportunities for us. We believe in everybody else's wines, right? I have no problem pouring any of theirs, and you know. And over time now, I mean, we've been doing it since 2014, so I know their portfolio and how it's evolved. Oh yeah. So uh, were you anyway, doing we virtual do virtual tasting since 2014? No, 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 no. no, no. We weren't that forthy. Just a collective <laughs> marketing back then. That would have been forethought. <laughs> yes, it would have. So no, anyway, we we are doing them with Texas Fine Wine. Uh, we do them every other month. Uh, mm. The next one will be on June 9th. So, uh, and what we do is, you know, we obviously you know, promote them to our wine club members, respectively, mm -hmm. and then we send wine to uh, to to media uh, so that they come on, and it's a chance for them. You know, I, you you know this. If you're in media, you get bottles all the time or you mm -hmm. get requests. Hey, can I send you this bottle? Would you try it? And, mm -hmm. you know, it's all those decisions like, well, do I have a time space to store all this wine? Am I ever going to write about it? Right. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you're actually like they open it up. They do put down their tasting notes and they can just talk to the winemaker or, or, you know, or at least an owner right then. And if they have any questions, they get all that extra information at that time and so, so is it just for media or is it consumers no alike? no it's both it's so both. that's 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 really interesting i like that to have both the media and the consumers on a virtual tasting mm -hmm. yeah no it's you know obviously you get very different questions <laughs> mm -hmm. no but i'm sure the consumers love the love the fact that someone's asking the the media like questions and yeah. vice versa the media is probably dying to hear what the consumers are asking <laughs> Yeah. No, anyway, it's worked out. I mean, last year we were doing them every single month. And then finally it was Denise is the name of our PR. And she was like, Denise, I just can't do this every month. <laughs> just, that, takes a, that takes a lot of work. No, it does. Uh, anyway, so we, we've gone to every other month and it's it, it's working out well. It's, it's, it actually becomes sort of fun every every other month to talk to people. And Oh, yeah. How do you, um? as far as I'm super curious, and especially talk to a lot of wineries on whether they're going to continue these formats, what do you see as the success or how has it evolved from when you did your first virtual tasting to now? Uh, well, the at first, I mean, I mean, we did some like we did Facebook live events and we did virtual tastings as just Petronellas. And my 
take on doing those is you just get much better, more interest if you have several different wineries. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've done it with the Texas Hill Country Winery Association. Uh, we have done corporate events where it is only our wine, but in that oh. case, the social part of it's really being provided by the the fact that these are teams that want to you know have some forum in which to interact you know other than flying to someplace. Yeah, that's a great. I um, was talking to Sarah Mall at Ben Social, and she does those type of cor corporate events where you, you have dispersed teams, and you can have like a, a collect or a a group um, Zoom meeting, and you're all kind of drinking the same wine or the same alcohol at the same time, mm -hmm. which forms as a, a, a real form of bonding. Yeah, no, no, it it really works. Uh, so yeah, no, I think, I mean, I, I definitely think that's there to stay. We, uh, again, because of the way Texas did the reopening, we had to reopen it. Some, one of the phases of our reopening, they really wanted to basically reclassify us as a restaurant and not a bar because they couldn't come up with a category winery, apparently. Right. You could, you were only, you're either a restaurant or a bar. Right? Yeah. So, because that made a lot of sense, but anyway, uh, so we started doing a lot more food pairing. Oh, do you have a restaurant uh, there? No, we don't. No, we don't. Just, just a more of a tasting pairing menu. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so like this coming Sunday, um, again, based on our experience during the pandemic, we do what we call these tasting room takeovers. Uh -huh. Usually on a Sunday, and we pick some part of our portfolio we want to feature, and we only pour that. We don't pour our normal tasting. So anyone uh -huh. who doesn't want to do that, and it's a paired tasting, yeah, you know, with those small bites with sure. it. I love those. Yeah. No. It, anyway, uh, it's just. Anyway, anyone who shows up and who wanted to just do a generic tasting would say, sorry, you obviously can buy a bottle and sit on, you know, sit mm -hmm. on the deck. You know, there's you know, but not you're crazy you not to do this paired tasting. <laughs> well, that's a do you do that virtually as well? Uh, we have talked about doing it virtually. And we, you know, we one of them, we kind of were working out, but can we turn this into a virtual event as well? And we decided just too complicated because you're it just is. trying to do that present and not present kind of thing so we just and they obviously so anyone virtually yes they can have the wine but they wouldn't have the food so mm -hmm. yeah the, the funnest one i went to they had a it was a virtual tasting with them everybody got the menu and we were all supposed to be cooking it while we were tasting oh wine. yeah i've seen those so you had a bunch of <laughs> it was wild <laughs> Var varying um various expressions of the same recipe <laughs> I like that. So that's that's a new experience. You've got the food and wine pairing type of um, mm -hmm. things. Do you see those experiences as the way the industry is moving forward, um, less than just like belly up to the bar? Well, I mean, yeah, I I, I think you're going to always have a mix of the two uh, mm -hmm. because you know you always. Uh, but I definitely think in terms of the long term relationship you're with your wine club members, yes. No, mm -hmm. I think that you know for them to just tell them. Oh, you can come in and do a ta another complimentary tasting. It's sort of like, oh wow, <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I think creating, if you will, points of experience. I mean, that's one of the reasons we're building this new building uh, is to give them a, a place where they're always seated. All the tastings mm -hmm. are seated, right? Because it's just for wine club members. I, we really feel that is what should happen. So, yeah. um, do you find people buy more? in an experienced tasting or a sit down tasting versus the casual? Generally speaking. Yeah. No, generally speaking. I mean, the other thing is that people are choosing very specifically to come. It's mm -hmm. usually smaller groups because I mean, not, you know, the reality is you know, the larger the group, the less wine is purchased uh -huh. <laughs> generally speaking uh, because they're, you know, it's more likely they're there to talk to each other and the wine is just sort of a lubricant to that. Yes. Uh, whereas, you know, if you have a couple or, you know, or two couples, they are usually very much focused on whatever the experience is. Uh, or they hit two experiences a day. Like the, the, the number of wines you visit is inversely correlated to the yes. amount of wines purchased. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, that's, that's a good point. I do see a lot. I do see that experience is just happening more and more. And that's, that's one of the things that I think is one of the biggest silver linings coming out of the pandemic is there is that further concentration on experiences. Yeah. No, it's big people. I mean, you just, you need, you, things that you never thought were so valuable to you. Like I remember the first time I could go and just when the, the restaurants reopened in Texas and, you know, mm -hmm. I, I would buy myself just to, to go sit in a restaurant and mm -hmm. just to sit there and then listen to that babble of voices around me. I was like, well, this is so comforting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So. How, um, as far as demographics, we talk a lot about the age demographics from Gen Z all the way up to, you know, 
Gen X, me and all the rep boomers. How are you bringing in the younger wine drinkers or what advice do you have to wineries looking to kind of cater to that, you know, mid 20 audience? You know, interesting. I, you know, I, the first thing I want to say is don't forget Gen X. Honestly mm -hmm. speaking, there's this tendency That's, because it's a smaller. We've always cohort. been forgotten. Yes. I, we were forgotten often. back when we were 20. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, it's just, you know, people go from talking about the boomers to talking about millennials. And you're like, uh -huh. just a minute. There were like a lot of people, like 42 million or so. Yeah. We just skipped over. Uh, so the, the fact is, don't forget. I, mean, I really feel that our target audience, obviously, it's about it's our age, too, mm -hmm. uh, is more nearly Gen X. Mm -hmm. uh, because we find within the Texas wine industry, we are actually just personally, there are, there are some much older, essentially my parents' generation are slightly mm -hmm. younger, uh, who formed wineries and are sort of established, you know, I would mm -hmm. say are some of the bigger, more established wineries. Uh, and then you have a bunch of wineries that are basically being run by maybe not millennials, but, you know, slightly older than millennials, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and we're kind of, again, stuck in the middle, but the fact is we sort of realized feel that, you know, for, to, to get interested in Texas wine, right. Mm -hmm. You're, the baby boomers are not, have never been our thing per se, mm -hmm. because, not that we don't appeal to older people, uh, but just because, you know, they're going to drink California, California cab, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Their tastes were formed in a different era. They're less mm -hmm. experimental. Um, but, you know, in terms of the younger consumers in general, and the, the interesting of Gen X actually kind of like is more tends this direction mm -hmm. is don't be afraid to serve them something they've never heard of. Right. Yeah. Uh, because that's really the things we, we bottle now grapes that even other people in the wine industry are like, Oh, what? Like we have a Tyrol to go, right. Mm -hmm. Tyrol to go. I mean, how many people who has a section of Tyrol to go in their local wine shop. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so we, being willing to say, Hey, no, just bottle the best wine you can. And then just be willing to take the time to talk about it. Uh, and, and to teach your staff, right? Uh, we do a lot of internal uh, wine education because we want them to feel comfortable about talking about where Toronto goes from and where, you know, Sanso is and what Petite Sera is and, you know, um, and yeah, and just not, you know, whatever it is we decide to, to or Tariga, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, so have it, you have to, you do have to do that extra effort, uh, both with your staff and then also with consumers to say, you know, but uh, and, and I mean, I think ultimately, personally, you know, whereas the baby boomers, I think you still saw or you still see, I mean, a lot of the snob appeal of wine, right? Mm -hmm. You know, becoming a connoisseur and, you know, the whole thing. Whereas I would say, basically, when you're looking at the younger generations, it just doesn't, it doesn't fly because they're going to compare you more nearly to a craft brewery experience sure. where they also talk in detail about the hops they're using mm -hmm. and, you know, technical details. And so just, you know, be, you know, that's not a snobby, that's a geeky experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, I like that leaning into the education and the geekery of it is re really, it really would appeal, especially to me on the Gen X too. <laughs> <laughs> is, um, that is where, how was, how was great advice on that. As far as, um, as we're winding down here and I, I always mention I have the clunkiest closes ever. Um, who do you respect? Who do you respect most right now in the wine industry? Um, you know, I, I have to give a shout out, and this is obviously someone that you know outside of Texas people are not familiar with very deeply. Is uh, is Kim McPherson? Mm. Um, his father, Doc McPherson, uh, planted. I think it was in 1976. He planted in the High Plains, and that really was the sort of you know first. And this was part of Texas Tech, so he, Doc McPherson was a mm -hmm. professor. Uh, and um, but that experiment started to experiment with growing grapes in Texas. Because you have to understand, in Texas, prohibition worked, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> in the sense that there only one winery survived prohibition in Texas, wow. uh, and obviously making sacramental wine is down in down Val Verde, it's mm -hmm. way off the beating path. And so, and then what? Followed prohibition was a whole bunch of dry counties and wet counties and all kinds of prohibitions and laws that made mm -hmm. doing anything with alcohol just like no. Uh, and so it was really Doc McPherson, you know, saying, no, this is an agricultural product that we should be able to grow in Texas and do well. Um, and so his son uh, really turned it into a commercial you know, oh. entity as opposed to just an experimental entity. Uh, and I am always amazed. I mean, in terms of what I always say to people, like his price points are amazing. I don't know how he does it because his wine is 
always solid, right? It's just always uh -huh. solid. And yet he also can put it at price points that he can have it on the grocery store shelf. And you're like, you know, it's one of the best deals in the Texas wine section. And so I, I really admire that. And every time I talk to him, he's just very approachable. And he wants, you know, you ask him some question immediately. He was like, he, he describes what he had to do and the choices and, you know, and, and you know, he, there's no, even though he you know has a degree of pedigree within the industry, there's no snobbery there with that or anything. And so um, I, I, I would definitely give a shout out for him. Well, I'm excited. I got to check him out. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else I haven't asked you that you'd love to talk about? Well, I mean, you, 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 you know, you, you never asked about the wine and philosophy. I know I didn't. I didn't. I got so into it. So in two minutes or less, why is wine and philosophy? Wine and philosophy are actually, A, they're infinite subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, but B, it's also that it, wine culture and philosophical culture are actually grew up together. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's entirely random. Uh, that the, the fact is that both of them involve a kind of more step back approach to life, right? Let's mm -hmm. just take a step back and really think about it. Uh, and so the fact that, and they also, it was, you know, one of the world's first, you know, by today's standards, it wasn't a democracy in our sense, but a deliberative culture where you, it's, it's based on socializing and really trying to understand the other person and dialogue. Uh, and I think both wine and philosophy share those. Uh, and I, I do think there's a lot of crossover. I like the, di I mean, that dialogue has been so important and wine has been the lubrication for m many philosophical talks over the years. That's, been no that's known, but also this, the, the, like, I like the fact to talk about the infinite aspect of it mm -hmm. and also the, um, the way you can attribute something to juice. That's far more than beyond just the fact that it's fermented grape bottle. juice. <laughs> we're, we're bringing just, it's, it's fermented grape juice at its heart, but it's so much more. Yeah. And, it, and it's, all, it's that conferred meaning, I think, that really is that nexus. That I, I, It's what appeals to me and what actually got me into the wine industry, having come from a philosophical background. Cool. It's a, it's a good analysis. But thank you for bringing that up. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. <laughs> Julie, where can people find out more about you? Well, obviously, we're patternellasellers.com. You can follow us on social media. Um, I believe, you know, again, Patternella Sellers. Uh, but obviously you can come to the Texas Hill Country, right? And, and actually find out more by seeing what it's all Absolutely. about here. You got, you got to experience, experience it in person. Mm -hmm. Well, Julie, thank you so much for joining us today. It was thank lovely. You. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time, and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.